But anyway, I'm happy to be here with you today, and I want to share with you. Now, here we, here we go. I, I should begin by saying this. This passage before us is a very heavy passage. I'm not going to doctor it up and make it less than it is. It is a very heavy passage, and it's going to be presented, I believe, in a way that does honor to the passage, because what Jesus is speaking about here is not lightweight. We're living in an age, in a time, where we want to make everything seem to be kind of fluff, you know, and in even Christianity, for a lot of people, even Christianity is something that has to be a feel-good uh, kind of faith. And if you don't feel good about it, then, man, it's not real. You know, but the fact is, Jesus Christ is about to conclude his message. And as Christians, we need to understand. We need to understand that we are not exempt from pain. There are a lot of people who believe that as Christians, we're supposed to be exempt from pain. I mean, once you come to faith in Christ, isn't everything supposed to be just really easy and smooth? And, and, and Jesus is speaking now in such a serious way to those whom he was speaking to there on, on this uh, mountain for the Sermon on the Mount, and he is bringing them to a conclusion now. He's bringing his message to, a, to an end, and he is going to deal with the reality that all of us experience. Now, we have young people in here, and, um, and you have yet to experience some of the things that you will one day experience should the Lord give you some years. You know, and so at 20, if, if I'd have heard this message, I have to be honest with you, if I'd have heard this, this message here, the way I'm going to give it today, I would have looked at that guy up there thinking, I don't have a clue really what you're talking about, even though in my mind I would have thought, oh, I know all of that already. But when you get saved and you move on in your faith in Christ, you are going to discover that life isn't always as easy as you thought it should be. And you will sometimes, maybe many times over the course of your walk with the Lord, begin to question whether you made a good decision in following Christ. Because Jesus Christ here in the Sermon on the Mount is issuing a challenge to people, and he's about to conclude it in such a way that it is so, it is so real, it is so honest, that those who are listening are actually going to have an interesting response. And you'll see it in just a moment as we, as we look at this together. So let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 7 at verse 24. I'll read to verse 29, and we'll get into our study, a study that I chose to entitle, Two Roads, Two Trees, and Two Builders. Beginning at verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them... I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. Great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Notice how he closes his message. It isn't a smile, God has a wonderful plan for your life kind of conclusion. He's giving a warning, and he's speaking about what life actually is. Two men building houses, one on sand and one on the rock. Storms come, one falls, one remains. And that's what we'll be looking at today as we are about to conclude the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is using a series of comparisons in order that he might clarify the purpose of his message. And he's now issuing a challenge for them to follow him completely as his disciples. And he's doing this in the form of a parable. Now this particular parable here, it's called the parable of two builders. This parable is intended to draw a contrast. The contrast that he intends to draw is between listeners or hearers and doers. So there's a contrast that he's... Uh, presenting to them right now. And he's going to give people a chance to act in faith in response to what he's been teaching them. Again, he's developing a series of contrasts. We've been seeing this in chapter 7, all the way back in verse 13 and 14. 
because in verses 13 and 14, Jesus spoke of two roads. And these two roads were intended to illustrate the need to decide to choose the right path. And as we looked at this, we saw that life is filled with choices, and a wise individual would choose to pursue the way of the Lord. Seek ye first, he has said, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So there is a man who is being portrayed as having to make a choice. Well, obviously, Jesus is saying you need to choose wisely. Choose, choose to seek the Lord first. And so we saw that, the, the story of the two roads. And then he begins to speak concerning two trees. And remember with me, one of those trees produces good fruit, and the other tree produces rotten fruit. And so he intended to reveal that our lives produce fruit that demonstrates whether or not we have a relationship with God. A good tree produces good fruit, and a rotten tree pr produces rotten fruit. So you need to know whether or not you are, and this was his point, you need to know whether or not you are a tree that produces good fruit because you're abiding in him, or if you are in reality in your life producing that which is rotten, that which is corrupt. And so that's a pretty strong image that he was giving at that time. Now he concludes by speaking about two builders. And by speaking about these two builders, this reveals what is called the foundation of real faith. So he does so with what is called the parable of two builders. As I was preparing this message, I began to think about how we speak a language. We Christians, born-again Christians, evangelical Christians, speak a language that, that has been referred to as Christianese. That's our language, Christianese. And sometimes we have conversations that are in-house conversations. In other words, there are things that my wife Marie and I will speak about together that, that we know the background, and thus I don't have to give a full account or even use words that, that, uh, that everybody will understand. I, I can speak in such a way as just to, to sometimes abbreviate what I'm saying, and she knows exactly what it is that I'm speaking about. It's, it's, it, it's an in-house conversation. I could say, she could say to me, like, you remember how your mom and she may say something, and I go, oh, yeah, I fill in the entire conversation with just the, do you remember when we were, and I can fill in the whole conversation. It's in-house conversation. Well, we do that with one another, and I do that from the pulpit all the time, and I don't even realize I'm doing that. So I'll say something to you, I'll use the word parable, and I'm assuming everybody knows exactly what a parable is, and of course that may not be true. When I first got saved, I had not been a Christian more than a month or so, and I was at a Bible study, and uh, it was a house Bible study, and one of the young ladies after the study prayer meeting began to share because she said, today is my spiritual birthday. Today, she said, I have turned one year old in Christ. And I'm, I'm thinking, man, she's ancient. Man, she's been with Jesus a whole year. Because to me, a year was a long time. I was only saved for a month. And I was thinking, I wonder how wise I'll be in a year. And I still remember that. And I'm 20 years old just looking at her. And then she says, when I was in the world, and then she goes again, and, and in the world, she used the term the world so many times, I finally had a, I said, let me, oh, wait, stop. And I told her, stop. It's one of those times there were only like 10 or 12 people. So I could, I, she was talking. I said, wait a minute. Okay, you're confusing me. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, what are you talking about when you say the world? I mean, you keep saying the world. I said, as far as I know, that's where we are right now. I mean... What do you mean by that? And I'm serious. I mean, I seriously did not know what she's talking about when she said, when I was in the world, because that's Christianese. You may be speaking to somebody and say, oh, yeah, when I was in the world, and you think they know what you're talking about. They have no clue if they're not saved what you're talking about. They really don't. They'll just smile at you, but they don't have a clue. What do you mean the world? The world is a satanic system. It is energized by Satan. It is in distinct opposition to God and all that God wants. It's a whole system that is in opposition to God, and it's called the world. That's why we're told, love not the world, neither the things of the world, for the one who loves the world, well, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, that is all in opposition to God, it's passing away, and only the one who does the will of the Father remains. Well, we know that out of 1 John 2, 15 through 17. We know that, but when I was first saved, I had no clue what that, what that means. Well, the same is true with the word parable. 
See, I'll use the word parable, and that's found its way into the English language. We use the term parable, but I wanted to share with you, just as in brief, you know, when I say this is called the parable of two builders, there are some in this room who don't even know what I'm talking about by using the word parable. So let me define it for you for just a moment, and then I'm going to go into the parable. What Jesus is doing here is he's using a parable. A parable speaks of placing one thing next to another for the purpose of comparison. It's taking something from heaven and using earthly language so that you can take heavenly truth, couch it in an earthly illustration so people will be able to get an understanding of what Jesus Christ is speaking about. It's a story in which the nature and history of God's kingdom is portrayed figuratively. And by using parables, Jesus uses the familiar to communicate the unfamiliar. Jesus used parables very often. As a matter of fact, approximately one-third of Jesus' recorded teachings came by way of parables. Parables are, are both mirrors and windows. As, as mirrors, we, are, we see ourselves in them. As windows, we can see life through them. Parables reveal truth concerning His kingdom. Parables illustrate doctrine. Parables are used to develop spiritual understanding. Parables are intended to both conceal as well as to reveal. You'll see that when we get to Matthew chapter 13. You see, truth is revealed to those who desire to know, but it is concealed from those who are indifferent. We call them lazy or indifferent listeners. A parable is something when it's used that somebody will listen and say, I wonder what he meant by that. Whereas a lazy listener or an indifferent listener will say, who really cares? Why don't you speak more plainly? That makes no sense to me at all. So truth is revealed to those who desire it, but is concealed from those who are indifferent. Like it says in Proverbs 25, verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But the glory of kings is to search out a matter. You see the same message that awakens one to truth hardens another. It is the same sun that melts uh, wax that will harden clay. The same message that Jesus gave that awakened people to want more of God, that same identical message hardened others into opposition to him. In the same message that I give on a Sunday morning, and I give an invitation, there are some who come forward. In the same message, somebody got up and walked out. Same message. So the indifferent, or the, the clay, hardens with the sun, where the softer one whose heart is searching and longing for something else responds to truth. And Jesus used parables very often in order to awaken people to heavenly truth. He's giving people a chance to act in faith upon his words. It is one thing to hear, but it is truly something else to hear and obey. And a true Christian not only hears and agrees in theory, but a genuine Christian actually hears and obeys what the Word of God has to say. The fact is hearing and doing evidences true faith in Jesus Christ. The way that we live ultimately will evidence whether we have been saved or whether we are unsaved. And our lives really do reflect that. Someone once said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Now some people actually really appreciate good Bible teaching. They may even listen attentively and with interest. <laughs> there are those who will say that they think the Bible is a fascinating book and probably the best book that's ever been written. And, and sometimes they'll say that because they're sincere, and sometimes they'll say that simply because they're saying that. I don't know. You know, uh, Donald Trump recently was, you know, what's a good book? Oh, the best book is the Bible. You know, there are those who appreciate the Bible. Well, Donald, it also says there not to use coarse language. You might want to read it a little more, but that's just the bottom line. People, oh, I like it. It sounds good. It's a great book. And, and you know what? If I use certain terms, people are attracted to the terms I'm using, and it might help them to appreciate me more. We can do that. And you say, oh, are you speaking about just Donald Trump? No, look in your Bible. There was a guy by the name of Herod. 
And Herod was an official. And he was a man who actually listened to what the Bible had to say. He listened to good preaching. Uh, it's recorded in Mark chapter 6, verse 20. Herod feared John, speaking of John the Baptist. Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Herod listened to him. He protected him. And the things that he said, he listened attentively to, and he appreciated what he was saying. That, to me, is very interesting. He listened to him, but in the end, when his wife Herodias said, I want the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter, he had John's head cut off. Oh, he listened, but it didn't do anything to him. It didn't change his life. And there are a lot of people who like good Bible teaching who appreciate it, but don't build their life on what they're hearing. So Jesus is emphasizing the importance of not only hearing what he says, but also doing it. The actual doing of his words is what reveals a person's genuine faith. It's like what it says in James, in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, Do you not want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works, James said, faith without works is dead. So Jesus is giving a simple message to those who would follow him. And though we come to faith in him, life is still filled with difficulties. I wish, I used to wish this so much that I could stand up and say something like this. I used to wish that I could stand up and say, if you come to faith in Christ, you will never have a bad day again in your life. If you come to faith in Christ, your wallet will always be full of money. You'll always be healthy. You'll never have anxiety or sorrow of heart. Your children will become angels. I wish I could say that. But the Bible doesn't teach that, does it? The Bible teaches that though you come to faith in Christ, you still have difficulties. We, we are not insulated against hard times. We are not insulated against tragedies. We are not insulated against trials. These experiences are shared by every believer and unbeliever alike. And believers, Christians, are not exempt from life. So in this parable, the wise man built his life on faith, which is demonstrated by obedience to the word of God. But the foolish one built his life on the the shifting sands of human wisdom. When we look at this, I want you to notice this. The two people involved in the parable encounter the same trials. There's a difference. The difference is one builder builds on the rock. The other builder builds on sand. Christians realize that we are not insulated against hard times, and we know that we go through trials. We all go through the same kind of trials. We go through the same kinds of situations that everybody else goes through. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, said it like this. He said, Dear friends, Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised by these things. Don't think this is unique or something that we shouldn't have endured, like something strange is happening to you. What happens with us as believers, though, is we are gradually learning to trust in God through his word, and we ultimately come to trust him to rescue us. And we know that going through hard times actually turns out for the things that we have prayed God would do in our life. We want to know him better. We want to know his word experientially, not just intellectually. Well, you will go through conflict. You will go through through pain. You will go through sorrow of heart. You will go through those things because that's part of life. But there are lessons that we learn as Christians through those things. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 67, said it like this, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept your word. Psalm 119, verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. I've learned things through the pain. I've learned your statutes. I've kept your word. So we're not immune from life's pain. But we do know that God is in control, and through the storm we hold on to him. 
We understand that we're going to take a walk. It's a walk of faith. And sometimes in that walk of faith, you walk through a place that's called the valley of the shadow of death. But we learn to fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. We know that we're walking through, but we're not camping out in this valley of the shadow. We know that, but that's how we learn this. It's by going through these things. We learn that God is in control. We learn that God works his will and that he will have his good pleasure worked through us. We count it all joy when we enter into or fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of our faith worketh patience, but we're to let patience have her perfect work, that we may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing, like it says in James 1, 2 through 4. You see, Jesus taught us that true disciples remain faithful, especially in hard times. A genuine believer may be shaken, but this genuine believer is drawn closer to the Lord through that trial. A genuine believer knows that, that the trial refines us, firms us, strengthens us, that we might remain faithful to Jesus Christ. And we know that we're going to go through these things. And John 8, 31 and 32 says it like this, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Continue, persevere, hold on. You see, non-Christians will not build their lives on a sure foundation of the promises of God. They don't even know them, let alone cling to them. And because they don't, when trials and storms hit their lives, very often they're devastated. Again, Jesus says that their house is going to fall, and he says, and that fall is very great. Their foundation is built on philosophy, the philosophy of the world, and cannot deliver them. Ultimately, they're left with nothing to help in the time of need, and they end up without any hope. They go to a cistern in order to draw water. Cisterns during the time of Christ were, were, um, they were like tanks that were cut out of the rock. They would cut a, a hole and then dig out through the rock, and, and they'd open it up, and you could have up to 30,000, 40,000 gallons of water that would be stored in these cisterns. They, they, they would cut them out of the rock, and then they would put plaster uh, all through the interior. They would get a lid, and they would put the lid over that, and they would store water, because during the time of Christ to this day, they have what they call the early and the latter rains, and so there were dry seasons in between. And when God, would, when God promised to bring the children of Israel from Egypt, a, a land that relied on the Nile River for, for its agriculture and for water to drink and all of that, well, God said, I'm, t I'm bringing you from a place that relied on um, a magnificent river, the Nile. I'm taking you from there to a land that has a small water source called the Jordan. And God said... And so that small water source is not going to provide the needs that you have. It's not capable of doing that. I mean, if you go to, the, to Israel to this day, you go there right now during the summer, and, and portions of the Jordan River are, are so, so it's, it's not very wide at all. In some places, you can basically just almost just walk across without any problem at all, and it won't take you any time. You can pick up a rock and throw it across the Jordan. It's not the mighty rushing Jordan. It's a small uh, kind of water system. So God said, you're going to have to learn to rely on me. I will send you the er early rain, and I will send you the latter rain. And so that is a symbol of grace. So when the rain comes, you know who's providing for you. You're not relying on the Nile River, which was a god to the Egyptians. You're relying on me, who provides the water for you. And so the children of Israel understood that, and they knew that, and they understood that, that they needed to store water in time when, when, when there would be thirst, and so they would dig out cisterns for themselves, and, and they would take the water from the rains, and they would pour it into the cisterns for the dry times. And yet Jeremiah quotes the Lord, God speaking through Jeremiah, says, my, my, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of of living water, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. You have gone to your cistern in your time of thirst. 
you've dropped the bucket down to quench your thirst, but because you have forsaken God, he was telling the children of Israel, you have forsaken me and my grace towards you because you have chosen to do that. When you drop your bucket, it just hits the dry ground because the cistern had a, it was broken and the water you stored has seeped out and there's nothing there for you in your time of need. You're going to a cistern that cannot help you in your time of thirst. You see, God is the living water. Jesus said, if we come to him, he would cause us to have living water through the Spirit of God. And that's who we rely on. Christians encounter the same kinds of things that people in the world do, but we have a different perspective. As a believer, we, we learn to, by faith, see beyond the immediate with an eye on the future. We know that we're not exempt from difficulties. We know that we're not exempt from hurt. But by faith in Christ, knowing who we have trusted in, we not only endure, we even triumph. Believers trust that God works all things out for us. We know that when we go through these things, not only do we endure and have victory and triumph, but we actually, we know that God is going to do something to grow us deeper in Him. It's like what it says in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purposes. We know that. All things are going to somehow coordinate, working out together in our lives to produce what we've always wanted to have, but sometimes we're not willing to pay the price for this parable, again, shows two people encountering the same storm. They both experienced, notice with me, heavy rain. They both experienced floods. And they both experienced hurricane force winds. But there's a difference. One house is built on the rock. The other house is built on the sand. One has a solid foundation. The other doesn't. You see, a believer spends time in the Word of God. And as you're going through the Word of God, there are so many promises that God makes. That you begin to learn to trust His promise. And His promises are built on Him, the rock, and thus are unshakable. Like it says in Psalm 18, verse 31, Who is God except the Lord? Who is a rock except our God? Those whose lives are built on the rock are not going to fall when encountering the storms. We remain standing, and that's because we understand that even during the hard times, God is still at work. Psalm 34, 19 says it like this. Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. We go through difficult times, don't we? Every other person in life goes through them. We have difficult relationships. We can have a painful marriage. We can be hurt with our children. We can bury our loved ones. We can have families that are shattered. We can lose our jobs. We can lose our homes. We can lose our health. We can lose our friends. We can endure disappointments. We can see our most cherished dreams shattered. We can see our faith stretched to a breaking point. And yet we hold on. And we hold on. And we can have peace even as we go through all of those things. I shared years ago, and I've shared this a couple of times since then, how when my father went home to be with the Lord back in 2001, my father and I had grown very close. When I was a kid, when I was small, my dad was real indifferent. He was real to himself. My dad was a real quiet man. He, he didn't have conversations with me at all. My dad just didn't talk. My mom did more of the talking. She made up a, a lot for his silence. That woman could talk. And so, but my dad, my dad was real quiet. Like many of you who had a father similar to me, my dad was quiet. I mean, I'd walk into the den and he'd be watching TV and, 
And I didn't say a word to him. He'd never talked to me. And when it was a commercial, I had two to three minutes to talk to my dad. And he'd turn to me and he'd say, so how are you doing, son? And I'd say, I'm doing fine, dad. And commercial's over. And he'd go right back to whatever it was he was doing. That was my dad. And I was used to it. It wasn't like I didn't cry myself to sleep at night saying, oh, I wish daddy would talk. And that was my dad. That's just the way he was. And my dad wasn't very nice sometimes, too. My dad was very firm in many ways. When he was a young man, my dad had a bad temper. And so, you know, he was the kind of guy, like when the, when the bear's in the house, you're kind of quiet. That was my dad. He could have a bad temper sometimes. He was real gruff. I mean, it, whenever he'd talk to you, when I was little, it, it sounded like he was always yelling at me. It was just, just an odd kind of thing. But he was my dad, and I loved him to pieces. And we never had a conversation until I got saved. And after I got saved, I started opening up to my dad. I started talking to my dad. And we started, over time, having real friendship. And, and so, in, in, after leading my father to Christ and being his Bible teacher from the time he was in his late 40s, my dad and I, over the years after he got saved, became very, very, very close. And my dad was uh, everything to me. And so when my dad died... It was, it was unexpected. He had a heart attack on one day, and three, four days later, he was, he was with Jesus. And I was not prepared. I had been raised believing my father was Superman. And my dad used to try to prove to me he was Superman. He would do super things. And I had, as a little boy, I thought my dad was Superman. I can still remember he said, David, go into the garage and, and get this tool. I need a tool. And I say, okay, Dad. And I went walking in front of the house, walked up the driveway to go to the back. And I go into the very back, and my dad's in the garage at the toolbox getting the tool out. And I said, how'd you get here so fast, Dad? He said, oh, I just flew over the house. My dad taught me he was Superman. That's a true story. My dad said, I, I jumped over the house. I didn't want to wait for you. And I went into the house. Mom, Daddy flew over the house. She goes, well, he's Superman. And years later, my mom says, you, you know your dad almost broke his leg climbing that fence to get into that garage <laughs> to get that tool because my dad was, my dad was jealous because I like Superman. And he did not like the idea that I liked Superman, so he did everything he could to be my Superman. That's my dad. That's what he was like. And so when my dad died, I honestly, even as a 51-year-old man, was shocked that my father went home. He was only 74 that he went home so soon. It was a shock, and I didn't know how to deal with it. To this day. I'm talking about my dad, and my heart still hurts. Forgive me. It's a fact. We were that close. He was my dad, and I loved him with all my heart. So he went home to be with Jesus, and I had to do all the things that a son has to do, including burying my father. And one morning, after he had his funeral service and all of that, and we're still getting used to what's going on in our life and all, um, I was in bed, and I heard someone crying in the house. You know, and I mean, we just lost my father, and, and I heard someone crying. I thought it was one of my kids, because he was very close to my, my children. And so I, I, I could hear crying. It was very loud. The, the cry, the, it was, it was, it was the, the loud sobs. Some of you have heard, or perhaps even you, you, have, you have experienced this personally, where you cry, where you've cried, and it's loud. It's not a quiet at all. It's a loud kind of thing. Go to a funeral or see somebody who has just passed on and see the family there and, and the sobbing. And I could hear that. I, I heard the the loud tears that, were, they, that someone was expressing. And, and I remember waking up thinking, someone's crying, and I was the, I'm the father. I have to go and comfort whoever it was. And you can't imagine what I felt like when I realized it was me. I was crying. I was crying in my sleep. So loudly, it woke me up. And I'm looking for the one who's crying, and I realize my 
chest is heaving, and it was me. You will go through pain, and you will go through sorrow. You will go through hurt. You will go through shock and disappointment. You will, and if you haven't yet, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but you will, because life is just that way. I wish I could stand up here and say, hey, get saved and you'll never cry again. Get saved and every day is a happy day. I wish I could do that. But guess what? You go through pain, don't you? We all do. If I asked you, please come up. If I asked you, which I won't, <laughs> please come up. Tell us what really is going on in your life right now, please. Tell us how you really feel about your job. Tell us about your marriage. Tell us about your feelings with your kids. Tell me about, if you really were honest for a moment, you'd say, you know, it's been a struggle a little bit. I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death right now. There are a lot of you who are. I'm concerned. I don't know what I'm going to do about my job. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need to make a house payment. I haven't made enough. I don't know how I'm going to, how am I going to put food on my table? I'm going to lose my house. There are a lot of people like that. You're living paycheck to paycheck right now. Or you went to the doctor just last week. They said to you, you have this. And you're saying, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? I mean, some of you have sat down like I have recently with an ophthalmologist and says, you've got glaucoma and your, your eyesight is gone. That's it. There's no cure. There's no cure. And then you go, I need my eyes for a lot of reasons. <laughs> for a lot of reasons, including reading this book that I'm reading to you. I need to see, Lord. What are you going to do? That's what you do. But do you stay camped out in the valley of the shadow of death? No. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. Thou art with us. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. You're going to take me through. You didn't say I'm staying there. You said you'll take me through there. And that's the difference between a believer and one who doesn't know the Lord very well. We go through the valley, but I remember he said, you will go. You're not going to stay. And I'll be with you every step of the way. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. And you will learn some things that you've wanted to learn. You will learn them in the furnace of affliction that you may remain faithful to my word. And you will learn some things that you wouldn't have learned any other way. That's how it works. And it's true. We all know that God works in our lives. Isaiah 26, 3 says it like this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Paul in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. All of us know of the man Job. So I've had people approach me and said, they've said to me, oh, I feel like Job, I'm like Job. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. You're going through a hard time, but please don't say you're like Job. You are not like Job. Nobody on the face of the earth is like Job other than Job. Read Job. When God speaks concerning him, he begins by saying, you know, this is Job. He's a righteous man. He eschews evil. There's nobody like him on the face of the earth. So that automatically eliminates all of us. It's a righteous and a just man. And yet we know the story of Job. He lost everything that mattered most to him. He lost his children. He lost his health. He lost his reputation. All of this was lost. The enemy had come before the Lord and God had spoken to the enemy. We know the story of Job. Very famous story. The time when the sons of God came before him, God speaks to Satan. Satan was there amongst them. Where have you been, God says to him. Well, I've been going through, to and fro throughout the earth. What, what's that mean? When you read and study the book of Job, it simply means I've been up to no good. And God is actually saying to him, give an account of yourself. I know you've been up to no good. Now you tell me what you've been doing. Oh, I've been going to and fro throughout the earth. Oh, have you considered my servant Job, God says to him. When the word considered is used there, have you looked at him, tried, tried him, and found some weakness in him? That's what that word considered means. Have you looked at him? And try to find some weakness in him? Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, yeah, I have. 
but you've got your hand on him. But all you have to do is take all that he possesses and he will curse you to your face. Oh, really? I give you permission, go and take what he has. And we know he loses everything but retains his health. The next time he comes before, have you considered my servant? Well, of course, you know. But if you touch his skin, skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his skin. If you touch his skin, he will curse you to your face. You can work him over, God says, but you cannot take his life. Next thing you know, this righteous, dignified man is sitting with a broken piece of pottery scraping his skin that is filled with pustules. And he's got a wife who approaches him and brings words of encouragement. <laughs> Why do you hold on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate your counsel. There's so many levels of wisdom that you're giving me here. It's going to take a while for me to sift through them all. Then he has his friends who come, and as long as they're quiet, they're good counselors. And then they start saying, I've never seen a good person suffer like you. You've obviously got some hidden sin because you've lost your health and you've lost your wealth. And God knows you're supposed to be healthy and wealthy. Come on, confess. And they all come and lay it on him, and he's there saying, oh, how I wish I had a mediator between God and me, someone who could be my daysman, somebody who could be my, my advocate, somebody who could plead my cause. He was referring, obviously, to the one who would one day be with us, Jesus himself, the mediator that we have, our advocate. How I wish I had someone to plead my cause before the Lord. I'm not guilty. I haven't done what I'm accused of. And as we read the book of Job, he says at one point, Job 13, verse 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In Job 19, 25 through 27, I know that my Redeemer lives. He shall stand at last on the earth. And, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. My eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. I will see him. My Redeemer lives. Finally, the Lord approaches Job after all the counselors finally stopped their counsel. And God himself says, gird yourself like a man and answer me. I've got some questions. You've been asking questions of me, Job. Let me ask you a few. And you have this amazing confrontation that the Lord has with Job. Tell me, where were you when I told the waves to stop and go no further? Tell me if you know all of these things. Listen, I have named all the stars. I know them by name. Can you give me some of that information? You who are so wise and know so much, you've been questioning me. Let me question you. And Job, finally, his response, we all know it. I have been foolish. I've opened my mouth. I now will close my mouth. I will sit in silence. I have heard of you with the hearing of my ear, but now I see you with the seeing of my eye. How'd that happen, Job? Through the affliction? Through God sifting me and removing things from me till the only thing that was left is him? Is that what you want? He will sift you until there's nothing left in you except for him. Is that what you want? When you ask for it, remember he'll give it to you and you will become like him. What was Jesus if he was not a wounded healer? He understood us because he was with us and is human. He knows what tears are like, he wept. He wept for cities like Jerusalem, and he wept for people like Lazarus. He knew what it was like to be forsaken. He knew what it was like to have friends that he worked with. He poured his life into, one by one, forsaking him and fleeing until it's just some women and John at, 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 at Calvary when all the rest forsook him. Do you think he understands you? Of course he does. 
James tells us in chapter 5, verse 11, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job, seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You see, those who have yet to come into relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have a sure foundation. And because you don't, when trials and storms will hit your life, you can be devastated. And Jesus again said, their house falls, and that fall is very great. It's cataclysmic. That's because the foundation has been developed by experience, and the experience cannot secure. They're left with nothing, nothing to help them in time of need. They've gone to the broken cistern. There's no water in it. You see, a true disciple not only hears and agrees in theory of what God says, but they hear and they do. Hearing and doing is evidence of true faith in Christ. And we see the value of the things we've gone through, though we don't understand them. Like it says in Psalm 119, 71 again, it is good for me that I've been afflicted that I might learn your statutes. So Jesus in verse 24 says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, well, their house is built on a rock. When it speaks of the rock, it's a house that's built on believing and obeying God's word. And believing his word includes a call to trust God in all things. Psalm 42, verse 8 says, The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. And in the night, all of us go through night, a season of night, the season of night for your soul. What are you going to do, Father, my son who's not walking with you? What are you going to do, Father, for my wife who is just diagnosed with cancer? What are you going to do, Father, for my dad who doesn't know you and he's an alcoholic? Lord Jesus, what are you going to do? We do that, don't you? Have you had seasons of night in your life where it's just you and God? It's just you and God. I raised them right. I brought them to church. I gave them devotions. Look what they're doing. It's breaking my heart. It's breaking my heart. I told you this is a heavy message, but it's real but it's real. I've done my best, but I'm in a season of night, we can say to Jesus. Where is the one who gives songs in the night, we could ask. But we built our lives on a solid rock, on the rock. We all go through pain, we all go through trials, but when we do, we can cast our cares on him, for he cares for us, and we can have peace, and we can be secure. Again, that's because we trust the one who rescues. We built our lives on Jesus. In Luke 6, 47 and 48, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck, that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. So we go through struggles, yes. We run to the one who can rescue us when we go through these struggles. Psalm 62, verse 7, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. We're not immune from life's pain. We just know that God is in control and we trust him. True disciples, remain faithful, especially in the hard times. He says in verse 26 and 27, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, it fell. Great was its fall. Not only is your life built on that which cannot sustain, but the ultimate conclusion is eternal separation from God because you didn't build on him. There's a difference. Building on him and not building on him. Again, we go through the same kinds of things. 
H.G. Spafford was an attorney. He was a married man. He had four daughters. He was very successful, and he became wealthy. One summer, he sent his wife and daughters overseas on an ocean liner to spend time in Europe. In the middle of the voyage in mid-Atlantic, the ship sank. In a matter of minutes, his four daughters drowned. His wife was spared, was picked up by a French boat, landed in France, and from there she sent a cable to her husband. All lost, I alone remain, what shall I do? She didn't know it, but after a departure for Europe, there was a sudden bank crash. Mr. Spafford lost his wealth, and in one afternoon, from being a wealthy man, he became a poor one. Now he received a cable saying his four precious daughters are lost at sea. And how did he react? He sat down and he wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's how you can respond. It is well with my soul. God is in control. And when Jesus is speaking, now is this the kind of way you want to conclude a message? How did they respond? He's calling them. Make a decision. What will you build your life on? And as he says at verse 28, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. He taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. They were astonished. The word astonished means they were astounded. They were dumbfounded by the power of what Jesus was saying. He was teaching with the authority of heaven, and he did that with power. He denounced the religious leaders. He presented a clear way to salvation. He wasn't quoting other rabbis. He, he was the premier rabbi, and he was deep, and he was eloquent. And as he was speaking and they listened to him, they wondered at his words. It's kind of like later on in John's gospel how, how some officers were sent to go and arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. They said, go and arrest him. And they came back without the Lord. And so those who had sent them said, where, where is he? We sent you to go get him. And their only response, it's recorded in John 7, 46. The officers answered, they said, never has a man spoken like this man. There's no way that we would take him. The eloquence and the power and the authority. No, there's no way it would have been totally wrong for us to take this man. Nobody ever spoke like this man. His message is true, his message is powerful, but they only listened and did nothing. He wasn't speaking in this way to inform them. He was speaking in this way to provoke them to come to faith. He didn't want them to be amazed. He wanted them to obey. And that is the point of all true gospel teaching and preaching for people to come to faith in Christ. Two roads, two trees, two builders. And the question we have to ask ourselves today is what are we building our lives on? We're all going to go through storms. Some of you are in a storm right now. Is your life built on the rock? Or is your life built on sinking sand? My life is built on the rock. And I will not be shaken because of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you can say the same thing today. You will go through pain. You will go through sorrow. You will go through heartbreak. You will go through disappointment. But look up. Your redemption is nigh. Jesus is waiting to take you. And one of these days, there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more disease. There will be no more loss. Just joy. Just joy in the presence of God. And you will say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for bringing me through this. And that is building your life on the rock.